This is the Help, I'm a Contractor podcast. Hi, I'm Seth Lewis. I am a blue collar business coach. Finally, someone that understands what contractors actually go through. My goal and vision is to connect business owners with knowledge while tackling some of the industry's toughest challenges. Please subscribe to my content and let's support each other to create awareness for our industry. Check out what I have going on at www.bluecollarbusinesscoach.net. Check out my book that has helped business owners across the country change their business and their life. But for now, it's time for the show. Let's get it. Today on the show, I'm so excited. I have Steve Bittner of East Coast Floor Store, and it's going to be a great episode. We're going to be talking about what it's like to be bold in business, to start a business, to have a savings, to use it all and go out on a limb. It's going to be a great one. And really understanding how to do this, how to grow a business. And there's no better person to talk about this today than Steve. So Steve, welcome to the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me, Seth. It's great to have you on. Um, Tell me what you've been up to lately. Any any cool things? Any in, anything interesting that uh, you got going on in your world outside of work? I mean, that's a that's a uh, you know crazy one. But what what do you got going on? What's new? I mean, right now it's mostly work. So for fun, you know, I fly airplanes and things like that. But for the last last six months, it's been like you know nose to the grindstone, just getting it done. We'll uh, we'll have fun later. So. Um, you know, we've got, we've got kids and all that stuff. We try to make sure we, we have time for the family and everything, but we're working hard. So, you know, but nice weather's here. We'll, uh, we'll get out there and enjoy it a little bit. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about where you're located. Uh, just a little bit about your business today, and then we'll kind of go back and say, okay, how to get started. And, you know, the journey from there, you have a pretty interesting story. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, my wife and I own East Coast Floor Store, um, which is in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Uh, we we sell obviously primarily flooring, um, carpet, luxury vinyl plank, uh, hardwood, tile, a little bit of other stuff, you know, stack stone and, and different things like that. But we're, we look like a traditional floor store. We have a showroom, we've got a warehouse in the back. Um, and uh and so that's the business. We sell to a lot of uh, residential customers that just come in, uh, whether they need the flooring installed or whether they're just going to uh, do the installation themselves. A lot of DIYers out there. Um, but then we also sell to a lot of other businesses, whether they're um, installers, flooring installers directly, um, restoration contractors, builders, flippers, landlords, all kind of stuff. So good, uh, good, diverse group of uh, as far as our customer base so yeah it's good we're enjoying it what's uh how'd you get into the business and uh you know tell me a little bit more about your background and and the journey to get there yeah so um everybody's different mine was uh i i went to college and studied political science which has nothing to do with flooring at all thankfully um you know, young and dumb, and I was going to change the world. So um, uh, then uh, the Great Recession hit. So I graduated in 2009. And by 2008, you know, everything was going nuts. Um, I was, uh, you know, a big bad junior senior in college and uh, had the world by its uh, by the horns and everything. And then everything just crashed. So for the next three years after I graduated, I was you know, pushing a broom, digging ditches, running equipment for an electric contractor, just getting my hands dirty and uh, not really loving life, um, just struggling, you know, just struggling to make a living. They sent out a million resumes. There was nothing out there. Uh, so I got into construction unwillingly, but it happened. Um, then three years later, um, you know, God really just opened a door for me and uh, gave me an opportunity to uh, do project management and estimating. Uh, for an insurance restoration company. So, you know, your basement floods or your house burns down or whatever. So then I was the guy that um, had to come out, write an estimate for the insurance company, negotiate it with the adjuster to get it approved, and then project manage the work uh, through completion. So hiring and firing contractors, dealing with customers, contracts, um, sourcing material, you know, subbing the work out. So, uh, so that was 2012. 
um, and that was a, a great job. It's a great career. Uh, and I did that um, some version of estimating and project management uh, from 2012 to 2020. So 2019, 2020, um, I kind of felt capped out, like, you know, what else is there? Um, you can always go to a bigger company and I guess manage, you know, multi-million dollar projects instead of, you know, smaller projects, but, um, I, and, and that would have been possible, but I was looking for an opportunity to, to do something. I was toyed with the idea of having a business, but it's like, how in the world do you do that? Um, how do you get the money to do it? How, you know, how do you get the guts to do it? How do you walk away from your paycheck? Um, you know, it's making a great living, but you know, you get, you get restless and you want, you want more. Everybody's always looking for more. So, um, 2020 came this, uh, sickness hit us, um, which you might've heard about. And so everything went nuts. I still had a good job. Uh, it was nerve wracking, but, um, at the time I was kind of production manager for a company running day-to-day -day operations for a, a service construction company, um, in Maryland and trying to figure out what to do as far as how to invest and, and, uh, and uh, kind of several things happened at the same time. So the first thing was I started getting side work and that was based on just years in the industry at that point and becoming really good at what I did. So um, relationships that I had built years before and I stayed in contact with, it wasn't like networking to be a cheesy networking guy. It was just, you know, I worked next to the guy, the cubicle next to me and we stayed in contact. And even after we left, went separate ways, you know, we would, we would still call every month or two and how's your family doing? How are the kids? How's everything? Like genuinely, not, not trying to build a resume or like prepare for future business opportunities just because, you know, we were friends. And so I stayed in contact with a lot of people and through some of those relationships, um, I got an opportunity to do some side estimating. Um, and so negotiated terms, all that stuff, wrote up a contract and just started doing side estimates. Got a, got you know permission, approval from my employer because um, I had like a non-compete, non-disclosure type thing and said uh, the, the employer didn't provide. It was a great job, but he did not provide retirement. I said, look, man, I got to I got to be able to provide for my family long term. So I'm not asking for retirement. I'm asking to be released from the non-compete portion, um, the non-moonlighting portion of my contract so that I can start making some extra money on the side. It won't affect my job. Um, and then I can start, you know, being able to invest for, for my future. So he let me do it. Um, so everything was above board and I started doing insurance estimates on the side. Um, and with that money, I just, uh, I blew it all on big cruises and trips and stuff. No, I didn't. We didn't take any of the money. We just, we just let it pile up in the bank. We didn't know what we were going to do with it. So this is this is middle of 2020. Everything's going nuts. And all of a sudden I'm getting side work. So while everybody else is having a hard time, like I'm greatly blessed. But at the same time, I'm not trying to go blow it. For one thing, I couldn't go on a cruise because couldn't go on cruises. Um, but that's what was going on. So now I'm getting money. It's like middle of middle of 2020, just getting into the side estimating. It's like, well, what am I going to do with the money? Um, do I put it in the stock market, whatever, you know, obviously that was crazy, but it looked like there was a lot of potential. Um, so right around the same time, um, I had a conversation with my brother-in-law. Well, rewind to college and my brother-in-law at the time in college was my roommate. We ended up marrying sisters. And uh, so Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever, we would always get together and talk, you know, he got into flooring after college. I got into construction restoration. And so we were always feeling each other out because I was always hiring flooring guys and he's always trying to get restoration work as a flooring guy. So we're trying to figure out how the markets work and all that stuff. So we would always talk business. He started out as an installer. Then he got like a little, he rented a space and started selling product as well. And then he ended up building a floor store. So by middle of 2020, he had this, really very successful floor store, had this beautiful showroom. Everything was great. He's one of those guys that everything he touched turns to gold. Um, but to be fair to him, he works his tail off to get there. Um, so we're talking um, middle of 2020, like, you know, 
what do I do? And he's like, look, you've always talked about starting a business. He said, with, with COVID, he said, our business has changed entirely. He said, no one will come into our showroom anymore. So we had to on the dime pivot. This is literally middle of 2020. He's already telling me what they had to do. We've had to pivot. He said, we're listing stuff online on, on Craigslist and Marketplace as far as DIY flooring. People are willing to come buy it themselves to install it in their house, but they're not willing to come to the showroom. So they'll come pick it up out of the back of our warehouse, but won't walk through the front door. He's like, you could sell it out of your garage. So long story short, we're like, how are we going to do that? Um, he's like, I can, I can have it shipped to you. I won't mark it up much. Like you'll still get pretty good prices. Um, good enough to where you can compete and, uh, you know, just try to sell, it. you know, start with one pallet and see what happens. And uh, so that's what we did. But we're going to buy one pallet. If it doesn't sell, we'll install it in our house and we'll pretend it never happened. But a pallet of, of luxury vinyl plank is like 22, 2300 pounds. So it doesn't just like come in a UPS you know, truck or something. It comes on a, on a tractor trailer to our residential house in our residential neighborhood. So uh, the only time it would be delivered is during weekday when I'm at work. So my wife has to unload this you know, 22, 2300 pound pallet. So in order for that to logistically work, we had to buy a forklift. So the money that I was starting to make from the, uh, from the estimating went to buying the first pallet of flooring and to buying like a 1980s forklift with a blown out muffler and stuff. And so we became the house with the forklift in the neighborhood. And the first tractor trailer came and the guy was bewildered. He's like, where's the loading dock? Like, yeah, we no such thing, but my wife can drive a forklift. Well, she was terrified. It was a total chaos and fiasco, but it worked out. So that's how we started. We started out of our garage. We sold one pallet, turned into four pallets, turned into 12 pallets. Garage was totally packed. We couldn't even walk around to the garage anymore. Customers are coming, meeting us in our garage. And then uh, we just, we just grew from there and um, it kind of invented and figured stuff out as we went. And now we have, uh, now we look like a normal business. No one would ever know what happened two years ago and how it all started. That's an awesome story. Uh, just, just a great, great story of how it flowed, how it started. What were you, you know, when you think about that journey, there's a lot of people out there that want to start a business. We're probably in the same shoes, you know, they're in a, in an organization and they, they just feel like there might be more out there. A lot of people might go out and spend a ton of money. It sounds like your start was very organic. You know, what would you say or advice you'd give to somebody that might be listening and, and says, yeah, I want to start a business. How should I go about it? Yeah, well, listening to a podcast like this is really important because it means you care. It means you're thinking about it. And you're doing research. Um, we weren't prepared two or three years earlier to start a business, but I was interested. It was like, oh, that'd be awesome. But that's all it was. I had no knowledge of anything um, other than my specific job at my company as a W-2 employee. So in order for my knowledge base to broaden to where I had concepts of other things, I had to open my eyes. I had to wake up and start listening, which means I had to start listening to podcasts, reading business books, and no particular theme. Just like, you know, Warren Buffett is incredibly successful and whatever. And am I ever going to be a money manager? No but I'm still going to listen to him because he's incredibly successful in business. So all of these different podcasts and there's a ton of them, you know, a ton of them, you interviews, just YouTube interviews of business guys, guys giving lectures at colleges. You know, when Mark Cuban gets invited to come talk to the, to the MBAs at Harvard and Yale, like look those videos up and, and listen to what he has to say. Um, you know, Shark Tank guys. Well, that's really shallow. Shark Tank is really shallow. But then if somebody piques your interest, then start looking up interviews with them, like not just the, the four minute segments on CNBC, but like the in-depth stuff where you're really finding out how they think um, that the, their story of how they got to where they are. Um, so it's preparation as far as knowledge. Um, was humongous. And it was a period of several years where we, we would like name the year, like this year is the year of change. This is the year of intentionality. We literally had multiple of those years leading up to it. We didn't know why. We just knew we were preparing for something and we knew we were in a mess. We had tons of consumer debt. 
you know, we had tons of credit card debt, all that kind of stuff. We weren't prepared to start a business and it felt like we would never get anywhere, but we had to start somewhere. So it was like cleaning up our personal life with our finances, getting a budget. If you can't figure out how to run your own personal finances, how are you going to run your finances for your business? It's impossible. Um, being willing to prioritize the future at the expense of the present. So um, yeah, you know, when you get that Christmas bonus, when you get that tax refund, what are you spending it on? Like, does it stay in the bank? It, does it go towards an investment or is it going towards a new watch, towards vacation, towards uh, we're going out to eat? You know, I just got my bonus. We're getting lobster tonight. If that's the case, you're probably never going to get to the point or you're not ready to get to the point of, uh, of having a greater responsibility and investment in a business. Um, the other thing is, uh, is, is your relationships. I mentioned the relationships I had. I did not intend for them to bring me financial gain. It just happened. So the relationships you have now, you never know where they're going to lead. And you shouldn't be building relationships in order to maybe one day capitalize on them but it is a benefit of it. It's that golden rule karma thing where, you know, when you're, when you're genuinely uh, compassionate and loving towards other people, it's going to come back to bless you one way or another, whether it's financially or not. Um, so those are just a few things. Uh, another one I'm, I mentioned finances, but you got to save money. Um, Warren Buffett talks about, you know, you, you're making money when blood's in the streets and blood's not always in the streets. So when a, um, when a market crash like 2020 comes or right now what's happening with everything, you know, it's, it's pretty shaky out there right now. Maybe now's a great time to be investing, but if you don't have any money set aside, what are you going to do? Take a loan? That's super risky as well. Um, so anyway, lots of things to do. Um, the business will come to you. It, it's just, I, I believe that once you get your first one, then I think you probably have it. Thanks for listening to the show. I specialize in working with contractors and service business owners just like you. If you are your business and you're looking to do less, not more, if you have a great product or service, but deals aren't closing the way that you want, maybe you've grown so much and operationally it's been a mess. Maybe it's gaining back more time, better organization, and reducing stress. You know there's a better way to running your business. It's on you to take the first step. It's time. I can help. Go to www.bluecollarbusinesscoach.net and let's start by mapping out your current business versus what you want. Once you get your first one, then I think you probably have a better idea of looking for other ideas, but um, you got to learn from other people. They've already been there. One thing that one guy says in a podcast or in an interview or in a book, it only takes one sentence. You're sitting there on your couch at 1130 at night reading that last chapter of that business book. And he says one thing, it's like, wait a minute, I don't need to read anymore. Hold on. Let me just chew on this for a little bit. That's what happens, but it's the inspiration you get from other people. You're going to find a lot more value in than just sitting there by a lake, trying to dream up a business idea. It's very difficult to do that. Was there anything that in that journey, I love how you laid that out of getting your personal life in order, then taking it to a business, because it's so true. You can't run it. If, if your personal life is a disaster, that's just going to translate and you're going to multiply your own issues, challenges, problems. Was there anything that really stood out or a couple of things that stood out as you were on that journey of, of learning that you felt really helped you? Um, I, mean, I already talked about some of them. Um, one thing that was a massive advantage, we're always looking for the advantage, right? What's my competitive advantage? Um, one massive advantage I had was my relationship with my brother-in-law. He already had a floor store. Like he had already invented the wheel. He, he had worked at other floor stores before he started his. He was an installer. He knew every part of the business. Uh, so I was literally in five minutes able to get questions answered that would have taken me six months, a year, three years to figure out. Um, so having the person to go to uh, that can legitimately give you good advice, not that you take everything they do, like his business model and ours separated very quickly. We went towards out the door retail um, or out the door sales. So heavy inventory, all that kind of stuff. Whereas he stayed 
more towards install because that's what he was good at. He knew the install side. Um, so it didn't take long where we, where we split, but there were still things I was able to learn from him that were extremely valuable. I, I would much rather learn from somebody else's, you know, mistakes and, uh, and successes than have to create them on my own. What would you say when you look at that, that journey, some other, the, you know, steps. So the, the financial thing is obviously key. Um, you know, if you're talking to somebody that's thinking about this, cause I think that's where somebody might be They're you know, they're in the commercial space or they're working, they're a W2 employee. And it's just a matter of how do you do this? So, you know, the, the one step that I heard was research study. Second thing that I heard was get your finances in order. Is there any particular way or resources that you found that helped or did one day you just said, we're going to be intentional. And, you know, where did that come from? How does somebody be intentional? Does that just might sound like an easy, simple question, but there's one thing yeah. from thinking about it to actually doing it. So is there anything that helped you there? Well, um, I, th I think it is a decision, but sometimes decisions are made easier by circumstances. So the decision is to live broke, right? That's what, that's what some of these guys say is you have to live broke, Grant Cardone and whoever it is, whether you like him or not, there's still things you can gain from him. So uh, the concept is make yourself, make yourself desperate or make yourself have the feeling of desperation because then you'll be required to be creative. Um, so we were desperate because we couldn't pay our credit card bills. Right. It started years before and we were frustrated. We kept doing the same stupid things and we would go on trips, um, this awesome summer vacation. And we would come back and two months later, we're literally trying to stagger our bill payments to figure out how we can keep from totally imploding financially. And the stress and the arguments in our family and all that kind of stuff. We were desperate. We were frustrated. We were sick of it. So could we have chosen to you know, beat ourselves up mentally to the point where we didn't actually get to a point of actual financial crisis. Yeah, we could have, but we didn't. We waited until we actually got to financial crisis to get sick of it. But then some people will choose a victim mentality, right? Well, it's because of what everybody else has done and how can I look for a bailout, whether it's from the government or from family or whatever, or it's like, this is stupid. I'm gonna change, it is directly related whether I can get help elsewhere, it's directly related to my actions. Um, so I'm going to make a change. And then that begins the process. Once you've, um, as a Christian, it's called repentance. It's a change of mind, right? But in business or whatever, you don't have to be a Christian. It's literally changing your mind. And then your life will follow your actions. So if you've changed your mind on how your actions are regarding finances, regarding, um, you know, do you wake up at a certain time regarding, do you follow a schedule? Do you have a calendar? Are you organized? Is your house? If you're a hoarder, it probably means that that's not the only issue in your life. You've probably got a bunch of other things. That's just an indication that you've got problems that are going to prevent you from being successful in other areas of your life. So look at your house. Is it a total disaster? Is your garage always a wreck? Um, that doesn't in, that, in and of itself mean that you're not going to be successful, but it's like, Am I living a life of excellence? If I'm not, why would I expect to get a responsibility to get a position of excellence, either running a company as a fabulously paid CEO or as an owner myself? Why would I expect to get to that position if I'm not going to be excellent with what I have right now? Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's so, it's so key. A couple of things that I really liked that you said there was one, identifying other areas of, of, I call them symptoms. So symptoms are areas that are showing up that are a sign of a root issue. You know, issue might sound like strong to some people, but there's something else going on that, yeah, if, if this is happening over here, there's something that we could address, which is a good sign of how you get that, that fixed. Um, just, just really great stuff in the sense of, you know, just being a great leader What the steps that it takes to be, be a leader and, and have a business. So I really, really love that. Um, the other thing is, you know, the getting sick of it. When that happens, when you finally said, I've had enough and I'm done, change happens. Mm -hmm. When you did that, I'd like you to take me on the journey of your business. So you had this, I'm sick of it moment. Take me on the journey from when that happened 
to where you are today? Because I know there was, you know, rapid growth, rapid changes, but you had that moment. And I want to highlight that in the, in the show today is if you're not there yet, a lot of times people are close. And I talk to a lot of people and work with a lot of people and they, it's unfortunate that sometimes people have to get to that point and you can see it as a coach or an advisor, you can see it a million miles away that they just need it, but they haven't had that breaking point. So I guess two things, one, obviously I want to hear the journey, but what advice could you give to somebody that they're, they're struggling, but it just hasn't been bad enough for Mm -hmm. them to, to get to the breaking point. How can they recognize it? So they don't have to go through more misery and commit it. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's a really simple answer and I might be wrong on it, but I really think it comes down to choice to personal choice. So again, you can choose based on just sheer character and determination, which is really difficult. Most of the time we make the choice based on being prodded by circumstance, as I mentioned. So with me, I I was not the former, I was the latter, right? I, I wasn't smart enough to make the decision myself without a whole bunch of encouragement. The encouragement I got Started in 2017, I uh, I resigned my job from the the company I worked for 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 five years. That was that first project management estimating job. Fantastic job. Um, I was frustrated about some things, whatever, but I left on good terms. I gave you know a month's notice when I left. Everything was good, and uh, and I started flipping houses for a for a flipper, a really big company that flipped a lot of houses, like 200 houses a year. Um, and that was extremely interesting. A year later, I got laid off. Probably I deserved to be laid off. Not that I was a bad employee, not that I did anything wrong, um, but I wasn't, I wasn't what I could have been. I know I wasn't. And I've told people that I've hired since then, I tell them my story. I say, look, I was a W-2 employee. I was not the employee I should have been. I wasn't driven. I wasn't aggressive. I got, you know, I was more interested in what does my office look like than what value am I providing to the company? I was driven as an employee, not, I did not have the owner mindset, which the owner mindset is, is the decision that I'm making now is the action I'm going to take or the purchase that I'm, you know, what the item I'm going to pay for, is that going to increase sales for the company? Is it going to increase, um, you know, the overall benefit of the company, whether it's directly sales or if it's, you know, future sales through, um, you know, customer, whatever, I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on the comfort of the job. And, um, you know, my family's most important and the job comes second. Okay, that's true. But we can also use that as an excuse to not give it our best um, when we're when we are on the clock, when we are working. So I got laid off. That was the first time I ever lost a job in my life. Um, and I was royally incensed by it um, and was convinced that they were totally wrong. Um, and whatever, it was laid off, it wasn't fired. So I got another job and that job was not a great job. Um, it was project management estimating. It was a miserable company to work for. I thoroughly hated it. Looking back now, I still can't, can't stand that time. And after six months, I got fired. So in a period of six months, I got laid off and then I got fired. I never got laid off or fired from anything in my life. Um, I got fired without cause. And, um, I think it was unjust. However, again, maybe I deserved part of it. Maybe it was because I was miserable and maybe that showed, you know, at the time I, I could justify everything. Um, but maybe it was legitimately, I needed to go. Maybe I wasn't beneficial to the company, whatever. I, I know that whether they were just jerks for firing me or whether they saw deep into my soul and realized I wasn't giving it everything that I had, even though I think I was performing okay, but not as good as I could have. Um, it was, a, it was like slap in the face. And then when you get fired or when you get laid off, now your finances become even more important. What do you have in the bank? So when I got fired, I didn't have a job for two months. I drove Lyft and Uber. It was utterly humiliating. I'm dropping people off at McDonald's and I can't afford to buy a hamburger myself. I've got three or four kids to support and a wife and a massive mortgage and all this stuff. I'm driving Lyft and Uber, which didn't even make sense. It would have, it, it cost me more than it. I should have just stayed home, but I wanted to get out and work and I didn't do the math. Um, it, I was a total disaster. So 
once I then landed another job, which was actually a really good job by the grace of God, um, once I landed that job, it was like, okay, we've been thoroughly humiliated. We've been thoroughly humbled, put in our place, brought really low. Um, our perspective had changed. And it's like, I'm going to do everything that I can. You know, I, I, I'm not letting go of this job. I still had the W-2 mindset, but now it was like, you know, I, I'm going to do my best. At that job, again, circumstances, at that job, I got called on the carpet as the, like running the day-to-day -day operations. Sometimes, you know, day-to-day -day operations guy, you know, the owner is still going to have a disagreement with him. And I got called on the carpet for something I thought was unjust. This is over a period of several years that this has happened. But as soon as I got called on the carpet, it was the first time at that job. And it was like PTSD. It was flashback to getting fired, to getting, um, to getting laid off. And it was like, oh, shoot, it could happen again here. Um, now he was just, the owner was just legitimately telling, I didn't think it was legitimate, but he was telling me something he didn't like, and he wanted changed, not a big deal. But to me, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm about to lose my job again. So over a period of time, it was just like, I got to get stuff figured out. I'm super dependent on other people. I have no money in the bank because we spend money as fast as we make it we're a total wreck. And so it was just a period. It was just a bunch of circumstances and other things, you know, that, that, it, you know, happen in life. It is what it is. Um, and it was like, you got to get stuff figured out. And, uh, and that changed my mindset. And I started listening, right. I was humble and I started listening to others. I started seeking advice, it's not just the advice from people who were going to console me and say, Oh, they treated you bad, but you know, people that are, on a podcast or on an interview somewhere, they could care less what you feel like. You know, Kevin O'Leary, you listen to an hour from him, you're not getting any consolation and you're not getting any pats on the back. He's going to tell you every day that you wake up, there's somebody halfway across the world who's waking up trying to figure out how they can kick your rear end every day, how they can totally destroy you in business. That's business. So I needed that kick in the pants. I got a whole bunch of them. And then we decided, okay, we've been kicked and slapped enough. We're going to make changes so that we're not continually finding ourselves in the same position. What's a sign for somebody that hasn't quite got to that point that they can recognize? So somebody's listening and they say, that sounds like me a little bit, but they haven't, mm -hmm. quote, broke yet or got to the low point. How can somebody recognize or what are some of the signs that they should be yeah. like, hey, this is me and I need to do something about it before I get there? Yeah, okay. that's a really good question. And even before I get to that, I would say, you better hope that you do break because um, your potential is incredible. Your potential is as high as the sky and further the, the, Elon Musk didn't wake up being Elon Musk, right? He just woke up as a little baby, just like the rest of us did. Um, there are very few people that are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And if they are, they probably don't love it. Like you want to be able to accomplish. You don't want to be born with a gold medal around your neck. You want to get the gold medal by winning and enjoying the accomplishment, the sense of accomplishment that brings. So if, if you're too stubborn to choose to change, you better hope you get broken because it will change your life if you react to that brokenness well. Um, but if there are signs, I would say it's, um, do you think like an owner? Do you think like an employee? That's the biggest one in my life um, was my mindset of how do I look at my job? Am I Am I, uh, am I trying to be on my phone when the boss isn't around? Am I finding that I have to put my phone down when the boss comes around? If I am, what is my, what's driving me? Am I actually trying to push the company forward? You say, well, it's not all about the company. Well, it is. That's why you were hired for one thing. But secondly, who's the guy that's going to get promoted? The guy that is driving that company, he literally is trying to push for the best for that company every day of his life or the mediocre guy that's on Instagram, half of his work day, even if it, okay, it's a salary position. So I'm allowed to be on my phone. Okay. Good for you. But I'm telling you from an employer's perspective, they're looking for the guy that is driven when the boss isn't around and the boss will always catch you when you don't know he's around 100% of the time. It's impossible to, to hide from the boss all the time. It's better to get caught working hard than to get caught being a lazy bum not saying that somebody with a, a W-2 attitude is a lazy bum, but that's the perspective from the owner. So 
let's say your ultimate goal is to start a business. It's going to be easier to start a business from a position of CEO, COO, chief, whoever guy at the company making a whole lot more money where you have more capital to save to then start your business with than to be the guy that never gets promoted and never goes anywhere. It's just going to be easier. Yeah. I love, I love that about, you know, getting caught on your phone or working. Cause it's, it's so true. Any leader knows exactly who those people are and it's, you think you're hiding it, but it's just so, it's so silly. It's actually comical when you go around, come out to a job and the person's like, Oh, and then they try to fake it. Or there's a group that's standing there just talking. It's the same people. And then all of a sudden they scatter, but then there's, yeah. there's people and I can think of over the years that, you know, you, any job that you go to any place you arrive, they're always working when you show up. And those are the people that do well. Those are the people that grow. Those are the people that get the rewards. And if you're not yeah, then it's probably time to move companies or find somebody that appreciates you. Dave Ramsey is, uh, is one of those polarizing guys, kind of like Grant Cardone, either you love him or you hate him. But again, have the maturity to be willing to take the good and spit out the bad if you think that there's good or bad. Um, but he talks about, in his book, Entree Leadership, he talks about hiring stallions, or I'm um, sorry, thoroughbreds versus donkeys. And um, he, like the donkey's not, they're not fooling anyone by trying to act like, trying to walk like a thoroughbred. You still know they're a donkey. And that sounds like a really rude thing to say. But his point is either, either you are a go-getter or you're not. It's, it's very hard to be halfway in between. And I know that was, that was me. It was a change. It wasn't like this gradual shift, this gradual evolution of I became better and better and more motivated. It wasn't. It was like I continually stayed as a donkey for a long time until I made the decision. Thank God we have the ability to change. A donkey can't actually change his DNA. We can. Um, but either then as a business owner, which is what we're talking about and owning a business, um, as a business owner, one day you're going to also hire people and you're going to be able to tell, uh, is this person a donkey or are they a thoroughbred? It doesn't take very long to figure out. So if you one day would want to be an owner and you would one day have the ability to detect who the A players are and who the C players are, your boss also can tell that. And again, if they know that you're the thoroughbred, they're going to get you into a much better position and they're going to hate doing it because they know what happens when you start paying your employees really, really well. Um, there's a possibility they leave because they get so much money. They have the ability to start their own business. They figured out, they figured out the entire system and they can now go start their own. Although there's also the argument that if you pay them well enough, they're not going to take the risk because while they're an A player and they're a thoroughbred, they're not willing to take a three-year living on nothing pay cut to maybe possibly be able to break into the market. So um, yeah, just some thoughts. Well, what advice would you give to somebody that's, you know, starting a business or what's something that you want them to know? Like if you could say, you know, we talked about a bunch of things today. If you could, maybe summarize one or two or three points that are, that you feel are important in the business journey of a starting it and then maybe running it, you know, you, you run it day to day now, you know, just some, some good, some good nuggets for people. Yeah. I mean, one thing is, is um, always be learning. So the same process that you started the journey on where you're listening to podcasts and reading business books, listening to interviews and getting advice from other people, for me, from my brother-in-law, picking their brains. I'm doing that today. Every day I do that. When, when for me, I'm buying from reps, I'm their customer and I'm selling to my customers. When I buy from reps, I'm asking them, how are things going? I'm trying to figure out uh, what are the competitors that are also buying from those reps? What are those competitors buying? What's their business model like? I can't walk into those stores anymore because people recognize me. If they're my direct competitors, they know who I am and I get kicked out. Um, but, uh, but you're always trying to learn. You're always trying to get information because we've never arrived. Even if you arrive, the goals constantly change to where, okay, you might be at the end zone now, but you stay there in two years, you're back on the 20 yard line. So um, always be learning, always be listening, um, always be asking questions, always be humble. Um, that's as far as starting a business and as far as running a business um, with systems, with, uh, with, with everything. It's like, 
I, I constantly am, am wondering, okay, what, how do I address my, my next issue? There's always an issue in the business. Actually, there's always 10 issues in the business. And how do I address it? It's a point of frustration. How do I fix what bothers me? And which thing that bothers me is most important, learning to prioritize, learning to be willing to not have everything done because you can never get everything done. So which things do you prioritize? Um, you know, the importance of finance in business and, uh, and you know, making sure that you're, you're running your business by a budget, making sure you don't go bankrupt, making sure you're not too risky, but you're also not too... Um, that you're also not too conservative, both of those can kill you. And that's a really fine balance. And so again, that's where you're, you're, um, you're throwing ideas off of a hundred different people and they'll all have different opinions, but you can still glean from different things they say. Um, and then, you know, we haven't really talked about customers, but customers are king. When, when, the, uh, when the customer walks in the door, everything else disappears, like nothing else matters. You know, organizing your paper clips doesn't matter when a customer walks in, that's a sale. The sales are the key. That's the lifeblood of the business. Um, so when you're thinking about starting your business, what does the customer need? When I'm selling to a restoration contractor, I know what they need because I used to be a project manager at a restoration company. So I know what they need. But what? how can I make that person's life easier? Is it with cheaper prices? Sometimes cheaper prices drive, but we go to restaurants that aren't the cheapest sometimes because it's not just about price. It's also about quality. It's also about convenience. It's about um, availability. In your particular market that you're st uh, starting a business, does the product need to be there immediately in order to close the sale? With mine, inventory is really nice to have. Um, but with some, if you go to certain restaurants, those you go to Starbucks, and those customers are not expecting a coffee within 30 seconds of when they pull into the line because they know they're not going to get it. So you have to know your customer, know what they want, figure out how to service them. Um, lots of things. There's a million things to run into business and there's no way to be able, I mean, ask me in 30 years, I'll have a totally different set of answers. <laughs> That's great. Those are some great, great points. Some quick uh, fire questions just to, to wrap up. Uh, the construction industry would be better if. Hmm. If more people bought from East Coast floor store. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. No. Um, uh, I think if um, if there were better customer service, so customer service is king. Um, sometimes you have to fire the customer. It's true. Um, the customer is not always right, but customer service is greatly lacking. And that's, that's in every part of business. And it's not just construction. It's every business. Um, but um, treating the customer the way you would want to be treated whether it's you overprice them accidentally and don't find out until later, um, just every way that you treat the customer and whether or not you get a reward for it, whether or not they give you a review for it, um, treating the customer the way you would want to be treated. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, uh, I think that's key. I can build a blank in my sleep. Uh, See, I haven't listened to your quick fire thing, so I wasn't prepared for these. Um, <laughs> uh, I can build a uh, an estimate in my sleep, which doesn't help flooring at all. But that is how I got here. So you never know. Some people, yeah, spreadsheets. I mean, we get all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. Biggest challenge? Well, lots of challenges. Um, I'm going to go with one that's immediate. Um, I don't know if it's the biggest overall, but it's the one I'm thinking about the most right now which is the economy and sales because of the economy, um, because we're selling product um, and we're selling commodities, essentially. Um, that, is, that is the big challenge is uh, what is going to happen with sales. If sales dry up, our business is dead. So um, that is my immediate challenge. Sales are great right now, but I am concerned that they won't be. And the issue is not uh, that sales will stop. They will always continue. The question is, who's going to get those sales and how do you position? So I look at competitors that have been in the market for 60 years. They've gone through the Great Recession, through the dot-com bubble, through you know the, the, the market crashes in the 80s. They survived all of that. Um, I want to be those guys. You know, If somebody's going to go out of business, let it be them. I have to figure out how in 60 years I can still be around, but I have to survive this year. It's not a matter of if I can. I can. It's just will I. So- that's my biggest issue right now. Biggest skill? Uh, 
um, I hate these questions. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think sales and negotiation. Cabin or beach house? Ooh, um, beach house. Favorite Maybe. brand of equipment? <laughs> um, these are brutal. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Clark um, for a forklift. That's, we bought a, like this 1980s, you know, forklift and that thing is a monster. It's and just, I don't think it's ever had, I don't think it's ever had an oil change and it's still, it's, going, it's still going. Yeah. Lastly, you know, I want other business owners in construction or trades or whatever to know this. What is it? Well, I want them to know about East Coast Floor Store. So the thing that they need to know is that we have massive inventory in stock. We stock more than Home Depot or Lowe's. And we have better prices than even the big box stores. But we're a regular floor store in that we have top quality floor products, unlike some of the big box stores. So they need to look us up. If they're in like a two-hour radius, we have customers drive from New York, West Virginia, Northern Virginia, Delaware, all over because of our prices and our inventory and quality. So that's what I want them to know. And where can they find the information? East Coast Floor Store is a good one. Uh, to, uh, EastCoastFloorStore.com is the website. They can follow us on Facebook, East Coast Floor Store. They can call me direct, 717-640-1876. If, if they're a customer, I'd love to talk to them. I really appreciate your insights today and being on the show. Great insights for somebody that's looking to start a business, go on the journey, and people that are already on the journey. So thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Seth. Thanks for listening. Like and share with other contractors. Start studying 